Okay, the next item of business is, a stage, is stage three proceedings on aggregates, tax and devolved taxes administration Scotland bill. Uh, in dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, that is uh, SP Bill 38A, uh, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended uh, for around five minutes for the first division uh, of the stage three. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak uh, in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons or put RTS in the chat function as soon as possible after I call the vote. Members should now refer to the mar marshalled list of amendments. And we move firstly to Group 1, Scottish Aggregates Tax Information on Register. I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, in a group of its own, uh, Minister to move and speak to Amendment 1. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am arise to move uh, and speak to Amendment 1. Section 17 of the Bill places a duty on Revenue Scotland to maintain a register containing whatever information it deems required for the purpose of the collection and management of the Scottish aggregates tax. Revenue Scotland may publish information relating to the register, such as names and registration numbers of registered trading persons and the addresses, coordinates and boundary plans of any sites or other premises of those businesses. Section 17.6 makes further provision on Revenue Scotland's powers concerning the register, allowing information to be published, despite any obligation not to disclose that information which would otherwise apply. On reviewing the wording of this section, it may be interpreted as inadvertently overriding reserved data protection legislation. So, in order to provide reassurance that we are not legislation in reserved areas, Amendment 1 clarifies only obligations not to disclose information which are within devolved competence are relevant here. Uh, that is not something we would usually explicitly provide for, given the limits already in the Scotland Act, but due to the complexity of this particular area of law, we thought it best to provide that explicit reassurance. And I move Amendment 1 in my name and urge members to support it. Thank you, Minister. No other members have asked to speak. Is there anything you wish to add by way of wind-up, Minister? In that case, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment... Uh, we move to Grouping 2. Uh, Scottish Aggregates Tax, uh, uh, Group Treatment of Companies. I uh, call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendment 3, Minister, to move Amendment 2 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Minister. Part 1 of the Bill enables groups of companies to register collectively for Scottish Aggregates Tax. The benefits of doing this is that it reduces the administrative burden on taxpayers. Uh, the Bill sets out how groups of companies and members of such groups are to be treated with regard to tax liabilities and administrative processes. Companies who are part of a Scottish aggregates tax group may choose to add a new company to the group, remove a company from the existing group, substitute a company as a representative member of the group and or apply for companies to no longer be treated as a group. This is achieved by making an application in line with section 29.7 of the Bill. Section 29.8 pins the date that this change occurs to the start date of an accounting period. Revenue Scotland have identified that this date restriction could cause administrative issues for taxpayers and the tax authority. Amendments 2 and 3 would provide Revenue Scotland with greater flexibility in being able to action changes to groups at a date which they would set out in a notice, as opposed to being restricted to making the change at the start of an accounting period. These amendments aim to remove administrative issues that such a restriction would cause for both the taxpayer and for Revenue Scotland. I move amendments two and three in my name and I urge members to support the amendments in this group. Thank you again. No other members have asked to, to speak. Minister, anything to add by way of wind-up? Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Then the question is that amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 2. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Minister, move formally. Sorry. Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That takes us to Group 3, um, Scottish Aggregates Tax, Minor Amendments. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendment 5. Minister, to move Amendment 4 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, President Officer, Amendments 4 and 5 correct minor drafting errors in the Bill as amended at Stage 2 in Section 45A and 47, respectively. 
Section 45A inserts a new section into the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Act 2014, creating a penalty in relation to Scottish aggregates tax where a person fails to comply with Section 30A of this Bill, requiring notification to Revenue Scotland of any changes to group treatment applications or notifications. Amendment 4 clarifies that the reference to Section 30A would not be to the Bill as enacted. Section 47 also inserts a new section into the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Act 2014, providing that liability under the penalty provisions relating to Scottish aggregates tax will not arise where the taxpayer can show that there is a reasonable excuse for their conduct. Amendment 5 is consequential to an amendment agreed at stage 2 and clarifies that the liability to a penalty is in relation to a failure to comply with a requirement imposed by the Bill as enacted. Uh, I move amendments 4 and 5 uh, in my name and urge members to support amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. Again, no other members wishing uh, to add any further comments. Minister, anything to add? Add. The question, therefore, is Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 4. Minister, move formally. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. It moves on to uh, Group 4, Devolved Taxes Refusal of uh, Repayment. Call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendment 7. Minister to move Amendment 6 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, President Officer, Section uh, 113 of the Revenue Scotland uh, and Taxpayers Act 2014 sets out the circumstances in which Revenue Scotland need not give effect to a repayment claim to the extent that the claim falls within one of a list of exceptions. Originally, Section 52 of the Bill inserted a new exception, allowing the repayment of a claim to be refused in circumstances where a taxpayer has another amount of tax outstanding. This was primarily a revenue protection measure. Without this provision, Revenue Scotland would be required to give effect to a repayment claim by refunding the amount claimed and then try to recover any separate amount owed by the same taxpayer. I was pleased to hear during recent stakeholder engagement that the Law Society of Scotland is supportive of the policy intention behind this provision and thank them for engaging with my officials to help clarify the wording of the provision. During ongoing stakeholder engagement on the bill provisions, it became clear that the placement of this provision within Section 113 could give rise to some confusion, as Section 113 contains a list of the grounds on which Revenue Scotland need not ever give an effect to a repayment claim. This could result in a misunderstanding of the intention of this provision, which is only ever supposed to be temporary in effect. I have therefore lodged Amendments 6 and 7, which aim to provide greater clarity in this area. Amendment 6 introduces a new exception to the existing duty outlined in Schedule 3 of the Revenue, Tax and, uh, Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Act 2014, which requires Revenue Scotland to give effect to a claim or amendment as soon as practical after a claim is made, amended or corrected. The new exception introduced by Amendment 6 enables Revenue Scotland to disapply this duty to the extent of a fail to pay another amount of tax. The underlying duty to give effect to the claim continues to apply to the extent that the repayment exceeds the other amount of tax due, in which case the result would be a partial repayment to the taxpayer. As soon as the other amount of tax owed is settled, uh, the exception no longer applies and Revenue Scotland would be required to give effect to the entirety of the claim. So give way. Martin Whitfield. To the Minister to giving way, and in particular on that point, and it's with regard to the wording that's been used in paragraph 3. And can the Minister confirm that the claim that is referred to three times within that is actually the original claim, not a subsequent claim that um, someone who owes tax may be making? Minister. Uh, if I understand the member's correct, uh, question correctly, then that, that, is, that is correct. Um, I'm con uh, sorry, Amendment 7 is a consequential amendment which removes the existing Section 52 from the Bill. I'm conscious that uh, more now than, uh, than ever there are a range of pressures on the Scottish Government's budget, and so it's imperative that we protect those revenues raised through devolved taxes. I would therefore urge all measures to support these amendments. I move Amendments 6 and 7. Thank you, Minister. And I call Liz Smith. Thank you. The Minister knows that at Stage 2, I raised some concerns following engagement with the Law Society that some of the safeguards for taxpayers were perhaps not sufficient to address any situation in which there was a dispute between a taxpayer and Revenue Scotland about the amount of tax that is found to be outstanding, plus about the process of appeal, should that be necessary. I am grateful to the Minister for engaging at Stage 2 and I am very pleased that in Amendments 6 and 7 these concerns have been addressed, so we support that. 
Thank you. I call the Minister to make any final comments. Minister. I just thank Liz Smith for her uh, comments and no further comments to add. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 6. Minister to move formally. Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed and that ends consideration of uh, amendments. Uh, at this stage, as members will be aware, um, in this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is um, required, uh, understanding orders, to decide whether or not, in her uh, view, any provision of the bill um, relates to a protected subject matter, that is, that it uh, modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in uh, her view, no provision of the Aggregates Tax and Devolved Taxes Administration Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. So the next item of business is a debate on Motion 14710 in the name of Ivan McKee on Aggregates Tax and Devolved Taxes Administration Scotland Bill at Stage 3. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the Request to Speak button. And I call uh, on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Minister, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm, and, uh, I arise to uh, speak on the, the Stage 3 debate on this uh, the Scottish Aggregates Tax um, Bill, and I'm reminded by the Deputy First Minister sat next to me that it was indeed her who started this bill on its journey, uh, so thanks to her and to my colleague Tom Arthur, who, um, who did most of the, the heavy lifting on taking this, uh, this bill through prior to me taking it up, and of course to officials who have worked on the bill and uh, to the, the, the committee for their constructive engagement and to stakeholders. Uh, this bill, which was uh, unanimously supported by all parties at stage one, provides for the key elements of a new devolved tax on the commercial exploitation of primary aggregates in Scotland. The Scottish aggregates tax will replace the UK aggregates levy in Scotland. In high-level terms, this will be a tax on crushed rock, gravel and sand from quarries, which is commercially exploited for the first time in Scotland. Uh, this new tax makes use of a Scotland Act 2016 power and will increase the number of devolved taxes and the proportion of the Scottish budget raised here in Scotland. Most of my speech today will focus on the Scottish aggregates tax. I will, however, briefly discuss part two of the bill, which includes provisions to support the effective and efficient collection of all fully devolved taxes by Revenue Scotland. So I would like to thank uh, all those who have been involved in the development of the bill up to this point. Uh, the bill has been informed by a valuable engagement with and input from representatives of the aggregates industry and a range of other interested organisations. Uh, and thanks also, of course, to the Finance and Public Administration Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the bill, as well as all those who provided evidence at uh, stage one. Uh, yes, I will. Fergus you. <coughs> Um, during stage one of this bill, uh, presiding officer, I urged the Scottish Government uh, to adopt the proposal of the Mineral Products Association, which was to establish a standing committee called a Scottish Minerals Forum, which would allow industry and government to work together to meet the enormous challenges ahead with £45 billion of projects uh, of a capital nature requiring aggregates uh, in SSEN's area alone. Now, I got a sympathetic response from Mr Arthur, and I appreciated that, but the MPA have heard absolutely nothing since then. Is this not something that is a simple, cheap uh, thing to do, which is essential to work properly with industry over the decades ahead? Minister, I can give you the time. I, I, I thank uh, Fergus Ewing for his, uh, his, his question. I know that he's a particular interest in, um, uh, in this proposal. What I would say is that uh, government, of course, through uh, uh, economy ministers, indeed all ministers across government, is uh, engaged extensively with all sectors of the economy, um, primarily uh, at a sector basis through industry leadership groups, of which I think there are now 15 or 16 in operation, all with uh, ministerial involvement. Um, I know that the sector is keen to engage in a structured way uh, with government more extensively, and I would very much welcome the establishment of, uh, of such a forum. Clearly, that does not require legislation to take it forward. Indeed, none of the other uh, ILGs, as far as I'm aware, have uh, legislative 
legislative uh, uh, framework around about them. So um, either through um, a subset of the, uh, the, the Construction Leadership Forum or indeed through a specific um, Minerals Industry Forum, I would be uh, very supportive um, of taking that, uh, that, proposal, that proposal forward. Um, so, uh, my over inte overall intention turning to the bill is that the Scottish aggregates tax will support the government's circular economy aspirations by encouraging the minimum necessary exploitation of primary aggregate while maximising the use of secondary and recycled aggregates. It will do this by taxing the commercial exploitation of primary aggregates, therefore creating a price signal to promote the use of secondary and recycled aggregates. I do ever recognise the clear importance of primary aggregates in supporting new housing, the building of new roads, the development of energy infrastructure and many other forms of construction activity. Uh, indeed. Daniel Johnson. Uh, to the Minister for Government. And connected to the point just raised Fergus Ewing, the industry say to me that they would actually uh, uh, be able to do more in terms of the use of secondary aggregates if uh, things like road standards kept pace with the state of technology. Does that not lend even more weight to the proposal that Mr Ewing says about having industry at the heart of setting this through some sort of forum? Minister. As, uh, as already indicated um, in response to, to Mr Ewing's comments, I am fully supportive of the establishment of such a body. Um, it, it does not need legislation to underpin it. Um, and I would uh, be very keen to meet with uh, the sector to see how we can take forward either, as I said, the establishment of a separate industry leadership group or, indeed, if it is more effective and industry agrees to work under the auspices of the existing uh, and very effective uh, construction leadership, uh, leadership forum. Um, so, and alongside uh, that work, the vital employment opportunities provided by quarries, a length and breadth of Scotland is critically important, many of course in rural and remote Scotland. However, our approach also reflects that the range and quality of secondary and recycled alternatives to primary <laughs> aggregates is continuously improving thanks to the industry's ongoing innovation. Much of the content of this bill reflects a decision to initially align key elements of the tax with the UK aggregates levy. Uh, this decision reflects the evidence and views we have heard during the development of the bill, which has been strongly welcomed by industry and other voices. I recognise, however, that there are uh, those who would have wanted us to go further, faster, but it is important to recognise that the bill allows for the Scottish aggregates tax to evolve over time, informed by Scotland-specific data collection and an increased understanding of the tax and its impact on the aggregates industry in Scotland. However, it is not to say that there is nothing different about this tax compared to the existing UK arrangements. In terms of distinctiveness, the bill includes a novel provision that allows for tax to be charged on those that purchase taxable aggregates from unregistered suppliers. This addresses industry concerns of unauthorised activity in Scotland and the level of compliance with current arrangements. This will help ensure that there is a level playing field for all. Before turning to the Part 2 provisions, I wanted to uh, comment on a particular issue which is not in the Bill, but has been a focus of scrutiny to date. Um, there has been understandable interest from Parliament about the future tax rate. I recognise the desire for clarity on this matter, and I am mindful of the importance of stability and certainty for taxpayers as we introduce a new tax. I would remind Parliament, however, that the proposed introduction date of this tax is still some time away, and its introduction is dependent on the passage of Scottish and UK legislation. It would be inappropriate for me to make any commitment at this time regarding the future tax rate. As with all devolved taxes, this will be set out as part of the annual Scottish budget process. To summarise, the overall intent of the Bill is to assist with a smooth transition to the Scottish administration of the tax, offer a degree of continuity for taxpayers and ensure that the devolved tax can evolve over time based on evidence to support Scottish Government circular economy objectives. Moving now to the second part of the Bill, this contains a number of provisions that will further optimise the administration of all devolved taxes and ensure that Scotland can continue to make use of modern advancements in its tax system. I recognise that stakeholders have raised concerns about the lack of consultation on these provisions. They have, however, been informed by detailed engagement with Revenue Scotland, and there has been ongoing stakeholder engagement throughout the bill process. Part two includes two enabling powers that will allow Scottish ministers to make regulations on how Revenue Scotland communicates with taxpayers and how they make use of automation. An amendment at stage two commits the Scottish Government to a formal consultation before these powers would be used. Any changes would be intended to ensure that Scotland continues to have an efficient and modern tax system. 
Part two also includes provisions which will allow Revenue Scotland to set off uh, undisputed amounts of taxpayer debits against the same taxpayers' credits. This provision will aid Revenue Scotland's ability to efficiently collect taxes while not disadvantaging the taxpayer. Overall, the provisions in Part 2 of the Bill will allow us to create and maintain a modern, efficient and effective tax system fit for a modern Scotland. Officer, this Bill delivers on a cross-party agreement to devolve further tax raising powers to the Scottish Parliament and will enhance the operational efficiency of Revenue Scotland. I look forward to the debate this afternoon and I ask mem members to support the Bill at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Liz Smith uh, around six minutes. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, clearly, any debate that uh, is about ensuring that we have the right tax structures to safeguard the future environment and sustainable development of Scotland is extremely important. Uh, and I think we should all take the opportunity to thank the witnesses who came to the committee and who contributed to the scrutiny of the bill, and indeed colleagues across the chamber whose work on the environment allows the rest of us to better understand the balance that is required between measures which encourage green industry policies and those which punish the detrimental behavioural change in tax evasion, because their insights have been invaluable. So, as we know, and in line with the Scottish Government's circular economy goals, this bill introduces a Scottish aggregates tax aimed at levying a tax on the commercial exploitation of primary ag aggregates. It retains the fundamental structure of the UK aggregates levy, and is designed to provide continuity for taxpayers while also evolving over time to support our environmental objectives. The Committee's report on the Bill, published uh, back in April, highlighted the broad support for the principle of levying a tax on the commercial exploitation of primary aggregates, with the majority of respondents agreeing to the proposed uh, tax, aligning it with the Scottish Government's uh, framework for tax 2021 and its more strategic objectives for the environment. And it was very clear that stakeholders welcomed the desire for consistency within the treatment of the tax. And that is one of the reasons why the Scottish Conservatives support the bill. That said, I want to address some of the critical concerns raised during our scrutiny, most especially the tension which arises between maximising recycling rates, which is obviously a key ambition of the bill, and keeping the tax as simple as possible for business. While witnesses broadly agreed that it would be preferable for the tax to match the rate charged by the UK levy to avoid any competitive disadvantage, we obviously have to recognise there are some complexities that will be involved. As mentioned previously, evidence presented to the committee indicated that the use of secondary aggregates could be expanded and that the quality of recycled materials is continuously improving. Yet stakeholders reported that the availability of these materials fluctuate with market conditions in both construction and demolition. And of course that raises important questions about the perceived inferiority of secondary aggregates, the lack of demand for them and the economic implications of our current tax regime, which may inadvertently push recyclable materials into landfills rather than facilitating their reuse. Thus, the committee expressed reservations regarding the ability of the tax to incentivise a switch to recycled secondary products and reduce the use of natural aggregates with either increasing the tax rate or broadening the use and classification of recycled aggregates. Another major challenge identified during our scrutiny was the lack of relevant data, which is vital for effective tax administration and compliance. And a problem I would suggest, and I know some of my colleagues on the Finance Committee agree with this, that there is a data problem generally about some aspects of taxation. I thought it was particularly concerning that there was an absence of Scotland-specific data from HMRC uh, regarding the volume of taxable materials since that hindered our understanding of the new tax and how it will function. And the committee rightly stressed that the need for that in order to establish the tax elasticities, and while that may be a very technical uh, economics uh, term, that tax elasticity really does matter. Then there were concerns about non-compliance within the existing uh, tax regime, anecdotal evidence suggesting that unregistered quarries operating in Scotland may be su significantly impacting the level playing field for legitimate businesses. So the committee appreciated Revenue Scotland's commitment to enhancing compliance and enforcement to address these concerns. We've urged Revenue Scotland to collaborate more closely with local authorities in order to identify 
unregulated quarrying activities and to ensure that all the operators comply with the tax ob obligations. Turning to part two of the bill, as others, uh, the Minister mentioned, we noted that it included several amendments uh, to the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Act 2014 regarding the administration of the devolved taxes. And while the proposals followed discussions with Revenue Scotland, the lack of formal consultation, um, which the Minister uh, acknowledged with the other tax holders, uh, was a matter of concern uh, for the committee. However, I think we are getting somewhere on all that aspect. There seems to be um, better stakeholder, stakeholder engagement. I take the point that Mr Ewing uh, mentioned uh, about the calls for a mineral, minerals industry platform to facilitate that ongoing dialogue because we uh, definitely need it. So to draw to a conclusion, I think we have made significant strides in addressing the challenges associated with the aggregates tax, but there are still some questions uh, that I think we uh, have to monitor and in due course perhaps we have to uh, produce a little bit more detail to answer them in full. Uh, we look forward to continued engagement with the Scottish Government, industry stakeholders and all members of this Parliament as we navigate the complexities of the legislation because it's vital that we remain committed to ensuring that our tax system supports both environmental sustainability and economic growth and we need to only look at the housing situation just now to see the pressing needs of construction industry and to understand that. So with these uh, ambitions in mind, Deputy Presiding Officer, and our original commitments to the Smith Commission and the 2016 Scotland Act, the Scottish Conservatives are happy to support the Bill at Stage 3. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I now call Michael Mara around five minutes, please, Mr. Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the establishment of the Scottish Aggregates Tax, and we will support the vote at decision time later this afternoon. Uh, members will be aware this tax was originally devolved, as the Minister has pointed out, in the Scotland Act 2016. And should the legislation pass today, the Scottish Government has said the tax will be introduced by the 1st of April 2026. Now, that is a full decade since the, uh, the devolution was agreed by all parties within the Smith Commission. Uh, members across the chamber frequently call for more devolution, for more powers for this parliament, including over taxation. And I would observe that if it takes the Scottish Government 10 years to devolve a tax that is, to a large extent, mirroring the pre-existing UK aggregates levy, parties should be canny when describing further uh, adjustments to the devolution settlement as an immediate salve to the country's woes. We might, might also look at examples uh, of social security benefits that are interminably delayed as further evidence of the same. And the SNP government would frequently do well to consider not so much its competences, but its incompetence. Uh, turning to the detail of the legislation, as I raised in this stage one debate, I do believe there remains some confusion in the Scottish Government's stated aims for the Scottish aggregate tax. The policy memorandum states that the new tax will retain the fundamental structure of the UK aggregates levy as this, and I quote, offers a degree of continuity for taxpayers. And from discussions with industry and evidence taken by our committee at stage one, I know that this close alignment with the UK system is welcomed uh, by industry. Uh, we should always avoid introducing difference to the system just for the sake of it. And I know the Minister believes in an efficient business environment. Uh, indeed, to do otherwise may risk putting Scottish businesses at competitive competitive disadvantage with businesses in other parts of the UK. However, the policy memorandum also states that the Scottish Government intends that the SAT will align with wider ambitions to deliver a fair, green and growing economy, in particular the Scottish Government's ambitions for a circular economy. And given that the tax does nothing to increase the availability of recycled or secondary aggregate, and as SEPA has said, recycled aggregates are very unlikely to displace virgin aggregate use altogether, this would suggest the Government intends to incentivise the use of recycled material by increasing the rate of SAT. And I take on board the uh, points that the Minister makes in terms of this is not the time or the place to tell us what that tax rate is going to be. It is rightly part of the budget considerations. But we all appreciate there is a balance to be struck when those decisions are come to. We would not expect the specific tax rates to be detailed in the legislation. However, for the sake of the industry who are concerned by this apparent contradic contradiction, Clarification from the Minister as to his Government's position in the longer term, mm. I think in terms of the intent, would be welcomed by the industry. And that's not to ask for a number to be produced today, but I think it would be right to signal to the industry where his Government intends to go on a policy basis. During Stage 1, the Finance Committee found that there is a dearth of disaggregated data for the current UK aggregates levy in Scotland, as mentioned by colleague uh, Liz Smith. This impacted on uh, the Committee's ability to scrutinise what the potential revenue implications might be be and the potential for behavioural effects. As the committee stated in our report, providing this data would help the Scottish Government
government to make a more informed decision when setting the rates of tax, uh, one which carefully balances the need to raise revenue, to advance environmental behaviour change and to align with the aims of an industry that is seeking to thrive in Scotland to provide economic benefit. The government should be considering non-punitive means to encourage the use of non-virgin aggregate, including reviewing standard use cases and promoting recycled product more generally, as my colleague Daniel Johnson has already uh, pointed out. I also believe there might be the case to promote tax credits, offsetting capital investment to enhance those standards of supply. It does require significant capital investment to actually produce the recycled uh, uh, aggregate, and we should be thinking about the positive incentives as well as the negative uh, means at the same time. This would, of course, be a matter for the budget, but it might also feature in the government's consideration of more circular business models for parts of the lower end of the value chain in this area. Uh, amendments brought by the Government at Stage 2 did serve to address some of the significant concerns I raised on behalf of stakeholders at Stage 1. These included an amendment to Section 54, which gives the Scottish Ministers the power to make regulations about communications from Revenue Scotland to taxpayers, in effect making the commitment to future consultation explicit, and that is welcome. This followed significant criticism by a range of stakeholders, including the Law Society, the Institute of Chartered Accountants and the Chartered Institute of Taxation, that the Government had failed to consult on Part 2 of the legislation. Given the infrequency with which such legislation is actually passed in Scotland, it was a missed opportunity to have knowledgeable stakeholders contribute to the construction of the Bill. Uh, an amendment to Section 56 clarified that set-off would not be used where the amount of tax due was in dispute, as Revenue Scotland told Committee in Evidence, so we appreciate that being set out clearly in the letter of the legislation. Given how infrequently the equivalent provision of the Act is actually used and the limited number of devolved taxes, two, three of the Bill is passed today. Along with many stakeholders, including the Law Society and the Institute of Chartered Accountants, I remain sceptical as to how necessary the measure even is. The Minister could perhaps explain why he feels it is necessary in his own contribution later. Um, uh, President officer, as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Parliament, getting on with the competent government and then demonstrating how devolution can work is exactly what we should be doing in this Parliament. Recognising that Scotland's taxes do not exist in a vacuum is critical, but rather they interact with the wider UK tax system. It is essential if we are to build a system in Scotland that works for the benefit of taxpayers and businesses and raises revenue in a sustainable way. And I urge the, urge the government to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Mara. I now call Ross Greer around four minutes. Mr. Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Michael Mara just said, it's been <coughs> excuse me, uh, a decade, almost a decade to the day, actually, uh, since all five parties in this Parliament agreed to the uh, devolution of the aggregates levy through the Smith Commission. Uh, it wasn't exactly the top priority of anyone involved in the discussions at that time, or even in, in many of the years since, but I am glad that this bill is finally before Parliament. It's not headline grabbing, but it is important. It's important exactly for the, the principles of good governance that Mr. Mara has just mentioned. And I'd like to start by echoing <coughs> excuse me. I'd like to start by echoing Liz Smith's uh, thanks not just to the witnesses who provided really important contributions to our committee's scrutiny of this, but to those from industry who did persuade the Scottish Government to delay this process by just a few more months that I think resulted in quite significant improvements to the bill that ended up coming before Parliament. Usually I'm frustrated by delays to legislation, but in this case I think what ended up being a delay of certainly no more than six months resulted in a significantly better first draft arriving uh, with the Finance Committee. And it is timely that the bill is going through now, shortly after the Circular Economy Bill. The policy memorandum makes clear the ambition that this levy contributes towards Scotland having a more circular economy, maximising the use of recycled aggregate and minimising the extraction of fresh aggregate. I recognise that there is still going to be a continued need for some time for fresh aggregate, but that need should reduce, particularly as the quality of recycled aggregate improves, as a number of colleagues have, have already noted. One of the challenges that was highlighted by the committee is that it's still not clear how this rebalancing towards greater use of recycled and less use of fresh or virgin aggregate will happen, because the Scottish Government has, for perfectly understandable reasons, also emphasised the desire to have a significant level of continuity with the existing UK system. Those are both perfectly laudable outcomes, but there's clearly a tension between them, because on the one hand, we want to shift the balance, and on the other hand, we want to maintain continuity with the system in the rest of the UK, which is not making, I believe, significant enough steps towards rebalancing in favour of recycled uh, aggregate. Paragraph 114 of the Committee's Stage 1 report 
directly address this. And I don't think, I'm still frustrated that the Scottish Government's response didn't address uh, that point uh, in particular. I raised it, I wasn't the only member to raise it in the stage one uh, debate. And even at that point, I don't think ministers fully grappled with it. So I'd welcome if in closing, uh, the Minister could do so. Now, I understand entirely that this afternoon is not the point at which to announce what the, the rates will be set at, but even an indication of direction of travel, I think, would be helpful at this point. I said in the, the stage one debate that I think there's one part of the puzzle still missing here. Far too often, buildings that are capable of being uh, refurbished in Scotland are being demolished simply because it's more cost-effective. Demolition is cheap. Demolition and most elements of new building are often uh, entirely or uh, significantly exempt from VAT. The construction of new buildings, though, typically is far more carbon and resource intensive than a refurbishment. Now, the Greens have long supported calls to reduce VAT for refurbishment, but that's reserved. I hope the UK government, uh, well, the new UK government rather, will consider uh, that change as part of their own circular economy efforts. But I think we need to look at the financial levers that are available to us here to incentivise less carbon intensive and environmentally degrading construction work. And something that is within our power is the creation of a demolition levy to sit alongside the aggregates levy. This has been long advocated for by the Chartered Institute of Building, who I've been doing some work with on it recently. An aggregates levy and demolition levy together would be much more effective at incentivising less carbon and resource intensive building practices and the demolition levy would of course need to be a local power so it would contribute towards the fiscal empowerment of local government and the, uh, fulfilling the principles of the, the Verity House Agreement. It would also contribute towards the preservation of our built heritage in Scotland. I think it's not hard to see the good that would do somewhere like Glasgow. So, presiding officer, whilst I think this bill is welcome today, it's a competent bill and the government should be congratulated on that. It is only one part of the puzzle and there's much more work to be done if we want to realise the ambitions of a circular economy. Thank you, Mr Greer. I now call Willie Rennie around four minutes. Mr Rennie. I want to thank the committee, the clerks, but also the witnesses. But in particular, I want to credit the minister, as I did at stage one, because that pause in the process of the legislation to consult and listen to the sector, I think, has resulted in a far superior bill and bringing it in alignment uh, with the predecessor tax and, indeed, with the UK system. So I want to credit the minister. It's not easy to slow things down sometimes when you're facing pressure to speed things up. So I want to commend the Minister for doing that. I, I recently visited Ango Park in my constituency, which is a sand and gravel quarry. I like to adorn a hard hat and a yellow jacket, so I'll take any excuse to go and visit these places. But it was fascinating that they've been in process. They've been extracting sand and gravel for 60 years. They have a huge depth of experience and knowledge. They effectively built the town of Glenrothes eh, and also bridges like the Clack Manager Bridge and important roads around the area as well, including the A92. So their knowledge is invaluable. And I think this speaks to Fergus Ewing's point earlier on. We need to draw on that knowledge, which is exactly what the Minister did by slowing down the process. They have two outstanding issues. They probably have more, but they have two main outstanding issues. One is about secondary materials or recycled materials. And I know the government is, has commissioned the support of Climate Exchange and the Ricardo Consultancy to do more research into the use of these materials. I think we need to be cautious because we know we've had various difficulties in the past with buildings like RAC, but also in cladding, that we need to make sure that we put building standards at the heart of any change that the tax system should incentivise the application to new building standards, not the other way around. Uh, otherwise, we may get into difficulties in future construction projects. And I know from my short... Yes, we'll take an intervention from... Fergus Ewing. Um, Mr Rennie makes points, all of which I, I have entire agreement. Um, does he agree with me that a mineral products forum would... The Scottish Minerals Forum would allow detailed consideration of these and many other complex points working to replenish national reserves, to deal with the aggregates required for individual projects, to plan ahead for projects which are vital to the prosperity and economic success of this country, and that without a specialist forum with the experts there, the construction industry leadership group simply can't do the job as well as a devoted, bespoke forum will? 
Willie Rennie, and give you the time back. Uh, Fergus Ewan has clearly been reading my mind map, because that's exactly what I was going to be saying uh, next, because it is important, I think, that we continue to have the engagement of the sector to make sure that they are bought into any change, that it complies with building standards and new practices, so that the tax system therefore follows on uh, beyond that. So I think he's absolutely right. We should have this forum, and I'm pleased the Minister is indicating that that might well be possible. Um, the, the second issue um, of um, interest from the sector and my colleagues at Angle Park is around uh, cross-border issues, which apparently still remain unresolved in terms of declarations, materials that move back and forward across the English-Scottish border through brokers or builders, merchants or others need to have clarity about how they are supposed to declare in a simple and fair way that does not provide any hindrance on their activities. And if we can get some clarity on that soon, I think the, the sector would appreciate that. So I will continue to pay close interest to this, not only because it is a new tax that is coming through the Smith powers, but also because it is an important sector that requires careful handling to make sure that we meet the new standards, that we have got a tax system to match. Thank you, Mr. Rennie. We now move to the open debate. I call first Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Daniel Johnston. Around four minutes, Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Finance and Public Administration Committee was the lead committee on this bill, and so I'm pleased to debate the aggregates tax and devolved tax administration bill at stage three. And I want to thank everyone who was involved in preparing our report, those who gave evidence, uh, committee members, and of course our clerking team, and indeed the ministers themselves. Whilst tax le legislation may not always set the pulse racing. This bill represents far more than a fiscal measure. It is a strategic tool that could shape Scotland's environmental landscape for years. As the Minister has so aptly outlined, the bill's central ambition is to align Scotland's tax framework with our environmental objectives. By incentivising the use of recycled materials over primary aggregates, it drives us towards a circular economy. Here, tax policy, when applied effectively, transcends its traditional function of raising revenue, it becomes a force capable of influencing behaviours and shaping cultural norms. Yet, as ever, the devil is in the detail, and the bill of this ambition demands rigorous scrutiny. A critical area requiring our attention is the delicate balance needed to create a tax system that is both business-friendly and potent enough to drive meaningful progress towards recycling. And without this balance, we risk two key pitfalls, either overburdening businesses and stifling growth, or failing to offer adequate incentives to inspire the behavioural changes needed. To meet the Bill's aspirations with tangible outcomes, we must carefully calibrate tax rates and expand the definition of recycled aggregates thoughtfully. Beyond the structure of the tax itself, a crucial issue is non-compliance, a persistent challenge within the current aggregates tax framework. When loopholes are exploited, public trust in the fairness of the system erodes, undermining the integrity of the tax regime. Although Revenue Scotland's efforts to improve compliance are commendable, enforcement cannot rely solely on top-down oversight. Local authorities with a grassroots connections must be empowered to play a greater role in identifying and addressing illicit activities. Without robust local level enforcement, we risk allowing unscrupulous operators to undermine the system, disadvantaging honest businesses in the process. Transparency is equally vital to the Bill's success. Stakeholders have rightly called for clear and effective communication around any tax changes. Adjusting tax rates is one thing, but articulating a compelling and accessible rationale for those changes is another. If we fail to clearly explain the reasoning behind our decisions, we risk alienating the very communities whose support is essential. Transparency is not just best practice, it is fundamental to maintaining public trust, which is crucial for the Bill's effectiveness. We must also consider the broader fiscal implications of switching off the UK aggregates levy for Scotland. This is a significant move, and with it comes a degree of uncertainty that requires thorough evaluation. While the pursuit of a greener future for Scotland is laudable, we must ensure we are not stepping into unknown territory without fully assessing the potential consequences. Comprehensive risk assessments are not just prudent, they are essential safeguards against unforeseen economic shocks that may arise from such bold changes. Similarly, the proposal to empower Revenue Scotland to levy taxes on those using unregistered quarries is a strong and necessary measure. It sends a clear message that tax evasion will not be tolerated. This is not merely a technical adjustment, but a critical step towards preventing a race to the bottom that could undermine both the Bill's environmental and economic goals. Holding every actor accountable ensures the integrity of the tax regime and supports the Bill's broader objectives. 
Finally, we must ask ourselves whether simply replicating the UK aggregate levy framework is the most effective approach to achieving our ambitions. While stability offers reassurance, it is ambition that drives progress. If we settle for merely mirroring the UK model, we risk missing a unique opportunity to craft a more innovative forward-thinking system that reflects Scotland's distinct environmental and economic priorities. Stability has its merits, but without bold ambition, we may fail to realise the full transformative potential this bill offers. Presiding officer, that aggregates tax and devolved taxes administration bill is far more than a routine fiscal measure. It represents a strategic opportunity to use tax policy as a powerful tool for environmental stewardship and economic innovation. This is not just about imposing another tax. It is about deliberately and thoughtfully constructing a greener, fairer economy. Let us move forward with precision and purpose, leaving no stone, whether primary or recycled, unturned as we work to secure a more sustainable future for Scotland. Thank you. I think, Mr Gibson, uh, I call Daniel Johnson around four minutes, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I, I don't really know how to follow on from such an amazing pun as has just been delivered to the, the Chamber from uh, Kenneth Gibson. But it, it, it does give me great pleasure to, to join uh, my former colleagues on the Finance Committee. And I, can I share uh, the rest of the Chamber's congratulations to them? I'd also, I think, like to commend both the current Minister, but also it's, it's good to have Tom Arthur in the Chamber with us who uh, shepherded this through uh, previous stages of the parliamentary process. Because I think it, it is uh, potentially uh, possible on first inspection to describe this as being a, a boring bit of legislation about taxation, as Kenneth Gibson uh, 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 just alluded to, and on uh, what would seem to amount to uh, gravel, rocks and sand. But these are the primary and basic products of construction and therefore are absolutely fundamental to the whole of the economy. And if growth is central to what we want to achieve, then actually these are the fundamental building blocks. To, to use another, uh, another pun, economic growth, in my view, has to be built. And, Deputy Presiding Officer, as you well know, I was recently in Orkney. And on that visit, uh, there was one fact that was uh, 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 imparted to me which really struck home, was that building costs in Orkney are 30% higher than on the mainland. And actually, on the outlying islands, they're 25% more. And, it, and in many ways, Orkney is a microcosm of Scotland as a whole. You know, we have higher costs of doing things, constructing things in Scotland, because while we have 32% of uh, the UK's land mass, uh, we have 8.1% of its population, meaning that our people and our places are more spread out. That just makes things more difficult to build. And that comes on top of the fact that actually it costs more to build things in the UK than other parts of the world. So, for example, it costs uh, £34 million per kilometre of rail in this country, as compared to 12.6 in France, 7.8 million pounds per kilometre uh, of road, whereas it's 4.24 million in France. Hospitals and schools cost 4.76 uh, uh, million per square minute, uh, 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 sorry, pounds per square metre, as opposed to France, it's 3.35. The point I'm getting to is we need to move very carefully. This is not a low-cost economy for building things. And critically, when you have a dispersed economy, things like roads, rails, hospitals and schools are really very important because our population is so uh, remote. And I think Ross Greer made a really important point because ultimately the point of this levy is to try and seek to move from primary to secondary aggregates. But I think we need to move carefully as well because it's not a zero-sum game. When I donned my hard hat and high vis, much as uh, uh, Willie Rennie has done, and visited the tarmac site. They were pointing out that poorly maintained roads can cost as much as 5 to 7 per cent in efficiency. So which is why I think it's really very important that if we seek to move uh, uh, industry from primary to secondary, as we do have forums such as the one that, that Fergus Ewing uh, is pointing out, not just to inform uh, the, the rates or the way that these levies work, but actually have an agreed pathway for that transition to pro from primary to secondary aggregates and to get that full picture of actually where all of these costs and efficiencies might be borne at. Because I think simply trying to reduce or depress the level of building could be really very detrimental to actually efficiency in delivering net zero because we need efficient roads and efficient infrastructure to do that. I see Mr Ewing getting to it. Happy to give way. Very good, Ewing. 
Does Ms Johnson agree with me that if there is not such a forum established, which meets fairly regularly, maybe twice a year, that there is a real risk that the government, although it wants to do projects like pump storage, like grid upgrade, like offshore development, like, uh, like uh, the A9, that we simply do not have the knowledge about the practicalities, about the need to have continuous availability of aggregate over the next 10, 20 years, uh, and therefore it would risk imperiling the capacity to have these vital projects actually done. Daniel Johnson. And I note the time deficit, so I'll close on this point. I, I, I do agree with that. And I think it was encouraging to hear the Minister say that, that, that he agreed with the principle, but I think we do need to see some established. And while it might not be quite as such as uh, no taxation without representation, maybe it is such a, a, a case of having no levy without listening uh, from uh, the government. I think certainly we need I think, the levy to be informed by best practice, but overarching uh, uh, point that it needs to be informed by our collective goals uh, for the economy. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. Mr Johnson references to Orkney gain you extra time and forgiveness for the poor puns. Uh, we move to wind up speeches. I call first Ross Greer around four minutes. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing, I just want to touch on the inclusion of some of the financial administrative changes in the bill, because I think that they are useful, and it was good that the government took this opportunity to engage in what is essentially a tidying up exercise in a, a range of other small areas uh, of tax administration in Scotland. I do think, though, that their inclusion into to this bill, sitting alongside the levy adds weight to the argument for an annual finance bill in Scotland. I should give particular credit to Liz Smith for having led the arguments for that uh, for some time. The ad hoc system of waiting for individual subject bills to come forward to which financial admin clean-up exercises can be tacked onto, I do not think is satisfactory. And if we move towards a, uh, a position where, as part of the budget process, we had an annual finance bill where we could engage in these kind of tidying up exercises, resolving these small niggles in the system. I think it would not just result in more effective parliamentary scrutiny, but a much more smoother, effective and efficient process. I also think some of the uh, administrative changes in this bill do point towards us needing to have a wider discussion across Parliament about the balance of primary and secondary legislation. For example, the changes here around the timescale for penalties for those who fail to pay tax. To me, that is the kind of area that could have been addressed through ministerial regulation making powers. If Parliament felt it appropriate, we could have required ministers to do it through the affirmative or even super affirmative procedure. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I thank Mr Griff for he, he may be interested that the DPLR committee is about to embark on an inquiry into the use of framework bills and secondary legislation. Would he agree with me that every uh, member should engage fully with that process? Ross Griff. Uh, I'm very grateful for the, the intervention, presiding officer, and I'm probably one of the few people in Scotland who is genuinely excited by the prospect of a DPLR committee inquiry into, into this balance of legislative approaches, because it's not necessarily the best use of Parliament's time, and it actually often re uh, results in restrictions, a lack of flexibility on areas that there would actually be complete consensus in here on, but where we felt the initial desire to put something into primary legislation, then found the, uh, the requirement to amend it and had to wait uh, until an appropriate legislative vehicle comes along, whereas if we'd used secondary legislation regulation making power in the first place, that would have been less of an issue. Um, in, in closing, I just want to point out that this isn't the last part of the Smith Commission process to be devolved. Uh, we are still waiting on the air departure tax. It's still stuck on the runway. I uh, couldn't let the committee convener be the only one to bring an appalling pun into the debate. Um, but we still need the UK Subsidy Control Act to be amended, uh, and I hope that the new UK government will look towards that. There again was complete consensus in this place on the devolution of air departure tax, but unless we resolve that issue around subsidy control, we won't be able to allow for the support for lifeline air services uh, to remote and island communities. And there are very different ideas, of course, across the chamber about what we would do with that particular uh, <clears throat> tax. But the act for it was passed in 2017, and we're still no closer to actually having control over it passed here. So it is a source of frustration, uh, to some extent, that 10 years on from the Smith Commission, we are still trying to finalise that process. And at least on the issue of air departure tax, uh, I'm not aware of the new UK government having stated its position. I would hope that we're not still here at the end of this parliamentary session, entirely unaware as to the point at which we will be able to, in practice, devolve that and take control 
over it here. Um, I do want to just briefly pick up on uh, Daniel Johnson's point around the, the cost uh, of building here in the UK, and I agree with that absolutely, and a lot of it is down to geography, but it's not all down to that, and I do think there is a need for us to have a serious conversation across the UK about why we are, frankly, so poor at the delivery of infrastructure projects and why they cost so much more than equivalent projects in comparable countries, including in comparable remote and island communities as well. Um, I just want to, to finish by uh, thanking uh, not just the, the Minister, Mr McKee, but um, I'm glad to see that Tom Arthur is in the Chamber uh, here, having uh, led this bill through much of the process. I think this has been an excellent example of collaboration across the Parliament, not necessarily on an issue that has seized the headlines, but what we have in front of us is a competent piece of legislation that I presume will be agreed by uh, unanimous consent of the Parliament this afternoon. And I think that is significantly to the credit of both Ministers and the bill team. Thank you, Mr Greer. I now call on Michael Mara to close on behalf of uh, Scottish Labour. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I'll begin uh, where Ross Greer closed and put on record my compliments to the Minister and his predecessor, Tom Arthur, and all of their officials for the manner in which they pursued this legislation uh, on a cross-party basis uh, through Parliament over the, the last year and more. Uh, listening to the debate this afternoon, there is broad consensus that uh, this bill should pass, and, and rightly so. Um, and in maintaining that consensus approach, I do urge the Scottish Government to take that sensible, balanced approach forward and make sure that stakeholders uh, are heard when setting the rate when it comes to it. I have made this point in, in opening and I hope the Minister does uh, uh, listen to some of those calls and address it in the broad trajectory of policy uh, in his closing remarks today. I think that would give some comfort to the industry, um, who for, always, uh, for, for business, change is a challenge, something to be um, embraced at, at times, but also um, they want to have some level of clarity. Um, Kenneth uh, Gibson set out uh, uh, the power of that working in partnership and working with business, um, and, and rightly so. Difference for difference sake, frankly, benefits absolutely no one. But there have been various contributions that have highlighted the fact that Scotland is, of course, a different country, and it's both it's, uh, the geography and the needs and the state of our, our industry. Um, I think it's, it's right that we reflect on that, the challenges of building in Scotland. And I would fully agree with Ross Greer's <laughs> points on the need to look at the broader challenges of producing infrastructure, providing infrastructure uh, in Scotland, both in terms of the financing of that, and there's some uh, um, often commentary around that in terms of the level of capital funding available um, within the UK, but also how that is, is used right across uh, these islands and resulting in the much higher uh, bills that uh, Daniel Johnson uh, set out at length that are produced uh, in, in the UK. But so when we do introduce a new system, there is also an opportunity, an opportunity to make sure that it avoids additional administrative burdens for business over and above the current UK system in this, uh, in this regard. Um, to do otherwise would risk the competitiveness of the industry in Scotland. Where new taxes do arise, we should endeavour to make the system of processing them as seamless as possible. And a first question should be whether we can make them simpler, whether we can reduce that administrative burden uh, on businesses and on taxpayers more generally. Uh, achieving the growth our economy and public finances and public services so badly need requires us to work with business, uh, not against it. Uh, the changes to other devolved taxes are, are mostly sensible, but I hope the, the government has heeded the public's concerns and will consult with stakeholders properly uh, prior to making change to those devolved taxes in the future. There has been some uh, commentary, obviously, on the, the, the potential for a finance bill, and I would agree with colleagues that is something that the government should be looking at very carefully, um, perhaps before the end of this session. Uh, the Parliament is now 25 years old, and with more powers than ever before, including over taxation, we would benefit from a more sophisticated instrument for updating tax legislation rather than just tacking it on to the end of another uh, uh, vaguely associated bill. So in closing, President Officer, Scottish Labour do support the establishment of the Scottish aggregates tax. The tax has been devolved. It is right that we finally get on with implementing it. Um, and all, uh, but we must take account of the wider context, both in terms of our interaction with the UK-wide tax system, as well as the impact on businesses, individuals and our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call on Jamie Halker johnson to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As others have done, can I thank all those involved in providing evidence uh, and in aiding our scrutiny of the Bill, and also to the two Ministers for their efforts uh, and their engagement. Uh, eight years after this power was originally devolved, here we are helping us where we are to do today. I recognise the broad support for the principle of the levy, but also the desire for consistency across 
the United Kingdom and within our important internal market, and that the tax must be kept as simple as possible for businesses, particularly those operating across the border and which will now have two different tax regimes and accompanying rules and regulations to contend with. As others have rightly said, getting tax regimes right is extremely important, particularly when this is setting up of a new tax or at least a new, uh, at least a new devolved tax, and one which could have significant impact on the sector if used unwisely. I think it was Fergus Ewing who highlighted in previous considerations that this bill could have far wider impact than intended, and he mentioned again today the impact on projects like the A9. And, that's all, and of course, uh, Daniel Johnson highlighted some of the problems we face on the islands with already higher costs and the impact this could have. Our stage one considerations in this chamber came only the day after the Scottish Government declared a housing emergency. And as I said then, the Scottish Government will likely have choices to make between environmental and economic targets if they're considering putting up the rate in the future. I won't rehash all the arguments and concerns around the bill from today or from previous considerations, but I would like to highlight a few contributions from colleagues. Michael Mara uh, was right to say that it will be 10 years since uh, this power was devolved before we see it actually implemented. Um, and, I do, and I also do accept uh, the need, and I think industry would welcome a clarification on the intent of government going forward, if not all the details. Uh, Ross Greer was probably also right, saying this is not headline grabbing, but it is an important piece of legislation, and also highlighting that the delay, while we criticise government for delays and uh, for bills delay, this was probably a useful, uh, a useful day to have to, to bring forward a better bill. Um, he, like me, probably questions the effectiveness of the bill um, uh, in terms of meeting its uh, intentions, albeit we come from uh, different ends of the, uh, uh, the argument on it without the raising of those powers, uh, sorry, of the, without the raising of those rates. Um, Willie Rennie, uh, well, a very more, more positive speech this time. I remember last time he was a little bit of uh, an eeyore in terms of this exciting piece of legislation, but, uh, but he was absolutely right to highlight the role industry made and to uh, the, this, his intervention or the intervention by Fergus Ewing um, on this was absolutely right, and I'll come a little bit more that, to that later. Uh, and as I already said, Daniel Johnson highlighting the role uh, on Orkney and some of the kind of more remote communities and the impact he could have. Apart from that, there's some excellent contributions, some dreadful puns, but uh, I'll move on to some others. Uh, my colleague Liz Smith talked about both the quality and the availability of recycled aggregates and the risk of more being sent to landfill, and highlighted the Finance Committee's concerns that without changes in the rates, which the majority of witnesses were against, or at least broadening of the classification of recycled aggregates, the new tax might have little impact on the uptake of secondary aggregates. The Smith also highlighted the lack of data, a common concern for members of the Finance Committee in this and other bills that come before us for consideration. A lack of Scottish-specific data will likely improve uh, once collection starts, and in fact that's been promised, I think, by the Scottish Government. But it doesn't aid consideration of the bill or in any an analysis or predictions on the consequences intended or otherwise of the bill. We still don't know the amount of revenue that will likely be collected or whether it will be more or less than is currently received as part of the block grant. And that, for me, is at least a small matter of concern given the constrained times. Perhaps the Minister can clarify in his summing up how discussions with the new UK Government are progressing on this. I'm also concerned that the effectiveness of this new tax and of compliance with it will largely be down to awareness of it. And the lack of formal consultation by Scottish ministers with key industry stakeholders on part two of the bill before its inclusion, as Michael Mara mentioned, wasn't an encouraging sign. It is vital in this and all else that effective engagement is a key part of policy development. And I was disappointed, at least partly, that the minister's response to Fergus Ewing wasn't a little stronger, but I appreciate that's maybe something that can go forward. Presiding officers, I know other colleagues do, I believe creating incentive, incentives for investing in recycling, for using more recycled materials and keeping more away from landfill is a good thing. A thing. And so we will be supporting the bill today. But I retain some scepticism of how effectively it will encourage meaningful behavioural change without the significant changes in the rates that we all, or most of us anyway, recognise only creates inconsistency and challenges for those businesses operating across the UK. I know this is an issue that the Minister is aware of and that he does recognise the importance of continuity and stability across the UK and that witnesses mostly agreed of the need to keep the rate in line with the UK rate. The bill would pass today but we will only be clear of its effectiveness and its impact on Scottish revenues in the years to come.
Thank you, Mr Hawker Johnson. And I now call on Ivan McKee, uh, Minister, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'm pleased to close this debate on the Aggregates Tax and Devolved Taxes Administration Scotland Bill. And I welcome the contributions that have been made uh, in the course of the debate. Um, and I'll just touch on a few of those, uh, of those now. Liz Smith uh, and many other members raised uh, the issue of this balance between, um, she called it tension, I'd rather call it balance, between maximising recycling rates uh, and keeping simplicity and predictability indeed, uh, indeed for business. And uh, Michael Mara and others made, uh, made this point. Um, I think uh, in terms of um, where we are, it's important to recognise that this is closely related to a point raised by a number of other members around about the current lack of relevant data from HMRC, which um, prevents us understanding, um, as Liz Smith rightly pointed out, uh, more thoroughly uh, the issue of tax elasticity around this tax and also the behavioural impacts and how it might lead to those uh, behavioural changes we want to see in terms of uh, further increasing the take-up of recycled material within the sector. So I think the, the, the answer to the question in terms of where we're going on this is that the first piece is to collect relevant data so that we understand where we are. Uh, and, what, uh, and what options we have in front of us, and then to proceed from that basis uh, moving forward um, uh, through the, the budget process, as I've uh, rightly identified that uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary, will be taking forward uh, when the bill is in, uh, uh, in place um, and taking forward that, uh, that in due course. In the direction of travel is we want to absolutely work with the sector, <laughs> we want to increase those recycling rates, we want to make the, the tax, uh, the, the best Adam Smith principles of taxation, as transparent and as simple and easy to administer as possible, but we want to move in the distinctly Scottish context uh, in, in a direction that will maximise that uh, take-up of recycled material. Not just because it's the right thing to do for the environment, but, but also because we want to encourage the sector to, to work with them to be more innovative in terms of uh, the, 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 the invention and production at scale of those innovative materials, which in the long run is, uh, is where we'll create uh, wealth and jobs for uh, for the economy. Um, the sector has rightly been identified as a hugely important, um, although often unsung, um, key part of the Scottish economy, underpinning so many of the issues that we talk about uh, has been absolutely critical, be that on infrastructure, housing, uh, transport and many other uh, sectors, absolutely critical to the Scottish economy. And it's only right that government continues to work very closely with the sector. I note that uh, many members who have raised the issue of uh, a forum um, for working with the sector. As I've indicated, I don't think there's any need for that in legislation. Um, the government engages with many sectors on a very regular basis at ministerial level, and this sector is no exception. And I'm very, uh, very keen to work with the sector uh, in a forum that allows us to discuss uh, the, uh, the, the direction of travel with regards to this taxation, but also <coughs> issues around about innovation, around about skills, uh, and around about wider issues that, uh, uh, that impact this very important sector to, uh, to the economy. And I look forward to hearing from the sector as we work together to set up, uh, set up such a forum. And I hope that sets members' uh, minds at rest and indeed the sector at uh, understanding our seriousness and continue to engage uh, increasingly with them on these very, uh, very important, um, important issues. Um, Elizabeth also raised the issue of compliance, and um, I think it's clear in the steps we've taken within the legislation and the engagement to date that uh, a key focus of what we're trying to do by the way we've structured the tax is indeed to tackle uh, those, uh, those compliance, uh, compliance issues. Um, Ross Keir mentioned uh, also the, the need for more data and, uh, uh, and the need to um, clarity on the direction of travel, so I've answered that question in the comments I've made, uh, made so far. I also uh, mentioned the issue of, uh, of VAT. T on, um, on new build versus uh, demolition, and, and it's a, a call that we support, uh, and has uh, calls for a demolition levy, and that's something the government is, uh, uh, is recognises as, uh, as an issue, and willing to continue uh, discussions on the best route forward to reach the desired outcomes that we all seek uh, in that. Uh, in that regard. Willie Rennie raised the issue of um, cross-border um, transactions. Um, I can uh, absolutely commit the government will continue to work with HMRC to provide clarity uh, on different scenarios, different cross-border scenarios before the tax commences and Revenue Scotland will be issuing uh, guidance and advice um, on those various scenarios as we work through those uh, and we'll do so before the commencement of the tax in uh, 2020. 
26. Um, and a, a, a special mention goes to Jamie Halcrow Johnson, who, in a debate full of, uh, of weak puns, managed to get the word Eeyore into the official uh, report. So I look forward to reading, uh, re reading, reading on that. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, I would ask all members to support the bill that will provide Scotland with an additional fully devolved tax and ensure that Scotland continues to have an effective and modern tax system. I am conscious that this bill is just the start for the Scottish Aggregates Tax. If it is voted through today, I will continue to engage with both Parliament, stakeholders and the industry while developing the necessary secondary legislation to introduce the tax. Presiding officer, once again, I commend this bill to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on aggregates tax and devolved taxes administration, Scotland Bill at stage three. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time. And I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of standing orders that decision time be brought forward to now. I would invite uh, Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. To save us two seconds, President Officer, I move the motion. Yes, I am afraid I have to comply with the standing orders, Minister. Uh, the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. And the question is that motion 14710, in the name of Ivan McKee, on aggregates tax and devolved taxes administration Scotland Bill, be agreed. As this is a motion to pass the bill at stage three, the question must be decided by division and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system. Thank you.